how I ended up finally in candor and then retired. So uh, bear with me. I'm going to give you a little bit of history, European history, that is. Uh, I, uh, I'm sure everybody recognizes Italy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and obviously, this is Spain, and this is France. Yeah. And then you have Switzerland, then you have Austria, and then Germany up here. Okay? And then uh, over here is Greece, like this, and then Turkey comes here. This part, right here, was Yugoslavia. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yugoslavia. Oh. And I was born in 1952, so now you know how old I am. <laughs> in a place called... Pula, which is right on the tip of this little peninsula, bordering the Italian border. Venice is right here, two hour drive to my hometown from Venice. Yugoslavia, we we'll go back to the Roman Empire, for example, and I'll give you a little bit of uh, a little history. I won't bore you too much, but uh, when the Ottoman Empire came to occupy Europe, and the Roman Empire came to stop them. They stopped them probably right in the middle of Yugoslavia, oh. what used to be Yugoslavia. Yeah. Uh, then you have here, you have Bosnia, yeah. which we all heard about. Oh, okay. Then you have Serbia, here. And then you have Croatia, which comes like this, and all the way down, oh. like this. All the Croatian coast, is unbelievable. I have a book going around to, free field, to look at it. Oh. Um, the Croatian coast has over 1,400 islands on its wow. coast. Wow. Okay, And uh, it, it's a beautiful area to visit. Some of you have visited uh, Croatia. Uh, they are in this room. But anyway, I'm from a city called Pula in the province of Istria. That's what it's called, Istria. Pula just celebrated over 3,000 years of existence. And uh, we don't think 3,000 years. We only think 200 and some years, but we don't think 3,000 years. Uh, Croatia is also uh, predominantly 90% uh, or more Catholic, and Bosnia is 90% probably Muslim, and mixed with Serbia, which is uh, Russian Orthodox. So you have all those factions involved within the six republics of Yugoslavia. And forgive my scribbles over there. <laughs> but the reason I said this is that during the Second World War, uh, my mother and my father, they were both in the partisans, partis Tito's partisans. And the partisans, again, were against Hitler and Germany, as Hitler was occupying that whole area. Uh, my mother, being in a partisan, she was about 19, 20 years old, but almost to the end of the Second World War. My father and, and her didn't know each other at the time, but they were from the same town. And unfortunately, my father got captured, and he's a Holocaust survivor. My mother also. She was captured when she was uh, 20 years old. She was a professional seamstress in her days, and she was sewing uniforms for the partisans. The Germans didn't like that. Oh. So they took her and put her on the wall with all her other comrades to be executed, oh. unfortunately. And that's part of war, unfortunately. Luckily, uh, somebody knew the commandant of the uh, uh, German army and begged them that the young lady didn't know anything. And uh, he took her off the wall, but unfortunately in front of her they executed all her and that was, that was part of her 1920th birthday growing up. And the reason I say that, uh, just to give you a little bit of history for my family, being Holocaust survivors, uh, they, they did well through their lives. My father lived until he was 93 years old. My mother finished 91, they're past now, but uh, they lived a, a good long life. Unfortunately, in 1952, they met before 52 they met. I was born in 1952 and uh, lived in Croatia, in Pula, uh, for a few years until I was 10 years old. Unfortunately, my mom and dad divorced. In those days, 
that was not very often you find people divorced in those days, but they, they did divorce. Mm -hmm. And my mother at the time decided that she is going to go and leave Yugoslavia. And at the time, Yugoslavia was communist Yugoslavia, oh. socialism at the time, in 1950s, after Tito took over and liberated with the allies of America, uh, Yugoslavia became an uh, independent, socialist, slash communist country. So it was pretty much closed in the sense that, uh, you know, you couldn't move freely at the time. We had to go from <clears throat> Pula, we had to go right across the border into Italy, which my mother dragged me over, and I was a young man, I didn't know what was going on. Yeah. But uh, we stayed in Italy for a year, and uh, we, she decided that the uh, United States would be for her to, like every other immigrant, to come to America and start a new life. Wow. And I'm, to this day, grateful to her uh, for many, many things of bringing me up and giving me the future and possibility to be here mm -hmm. and to start, to start a new life. And this is a dream of every immigrant, mm -hmm. you know. In 19, uh, yeah. We immigrated in 1964, and we came to uh, Astoria, Queens, in the city. Predominantly Greek, Italian, and Croatian population, even to this day. In 64, if you remember, there was the Wolf's <laughs> Fair in Queens. I, I won't forget that as, as I came over. Uh, that's pretty much... Uh, I spent a little, little bit of my younger days in Yugoslavia or Croatia. But Croatia now is a very, it's a separate country, obviously. Mm -hmm. And the Croatia now is part of the European Union. It's a beautiful, flourishing democracy. Uh, we have, I'm also a citizen of Croatia. Mm -hmm. Because if you are born in Croatia, you always be a citizen, no matter what. Even if you have the American citizenship. So I have dual citizenship. Yeah. And that's just by their law, okay? And I still have property there that my wife and I go back to, and family there that we go back to every every year. And I'll come to that a little bit later, but uh, we, uh, we enjoy it. We are only two hours from Venice, and uh, the Adriatic Sea is just beautiful. And uh, it's predominantly really touristy now. Uh, it was, uh, Croatia really survives on tourism uh, a lot. So, uh, uh, being proud of my heritage and uh, coming to America, and uh, we came, my mother and I came with a small little dictionary, $350 in her pocket, oh. not knowing anyone, yeah. no family, nothing. We did get help, though, uh, finding a job. Uh, my mother, as I said, she was a professional seamstress. Mm -hmm. They found her a very, very nice job in uh, Manhattan, and she worked for Saks Fifth Avenue, Bird of Goodman, uh, on um, uh, sewing, you know, the dresses that are very, uh, if I still remember, it's, I'm sure you ladies will remember chiffon dresses, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, don't ask me, I'm just, I, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in Astoria, Queens. My first job was delivering papers. Yeah. It was. It was a great thing for me, it gave me a little extra money, and my mom, and you know, my birthdays were, what do, what do you want to buy for your birthday today, Demir? Well, maybe we need a bed, or <laughs> maybe we need a TV, or something like that. But that was, it was a great upbringing in the sense of uh, trying to make it through the <coughs> tough years of our life, because uh, my mother worked two jobs most of her life, and uh, we, uh, we tried to really better ourselves throughout. Uh, I went to Br Bryan High School, which was uh, uh, not almost a walking distance, but it was probably a couple of miles to uh, uh, the high school that I went to. Uh, I got involved at the high school uh, a lot in the sense that I played sports, I played soccer all my life. Uh, I enjoy still to this day the game. I still think I can play it in my mind, <laughs> but uh, it is a, it's a very great uh, sport. I was involved in the student government at the high, at high school and have good many friends from Croatia uh, that uh, I still keep in touch with at, at times. Growing up in Astoria, Queens was really great. I, I worked as a waiter. 
I did a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, Astoria Manor, which was uh, uh, a, a place where they held uh, uh, weddings and all of that. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, I worked there for a while. Mm -hmm. and, uh, come, <clears throat> come, and growing up and coming to high school, I always wanted to go to college. I always had a plan. Uh, to, you know, short-term and long-term plan. And uh, it, uh, it paid off. It paid off. So anyway, as, as I did my odd jobs, my mother at that time, when I was finishing high school, unfortunately, she had to go back to Croatia to take care of my grandmother. My grandmother was very, very cold and ill at the time, and we couldn't afford <clears throat> to send money because we didn't have a lot of money to send for somebody to take care of. So my mother gave me a choice. Either you go back with me, or you stay here and make something out of yourself. I was 19, 20 years old at the time. I was Americanized, right? I, I love this country more than anybody would ever know. Because again, this country did one thing for me. It gave me an opportunity to make something out of myself. And that is, that is a great thing to have if you have the determination and you have the will to keep moving forward and make something out of yourself. So my mother went back to Croatia to take care of my grandmother. I was left behind. Uh, and then something really, something really stupendous happened. I won the New York State Lottery. <laughs> Not what you think. <laughs> it wasn't millions. Oh. Or those of you who remember, and I'm sure most of you, in 1970 we had a draft. Yeah. Mm. But, but it was a draft. It wasn't volunteer. <laughs> so when I looked at my birth date and the the number that I'm going to be, if I'm going to be reached to be called for the armed forces, I was 50. Oh. So, of course, I got my notice, <laughs> report to Fort Dix, and uh, you are being drafted. Oh. And that was a New York State lottery that I won. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Luckily, luckily for myself, my family, I, I didn't go to Vietnam. Yeah. Yeah. Luckily, uh, it was, believe it or not, I, I lucked out. At that time, if you remember, it was... If you're the only surviving son yeah. in a family, they took pity on you, oh. and they gave me my walking papers. I know. <laughs> so I said, thank you, God, thank you, everything, you know. And uh, I, I got out of the Army, and uh, I'm here today to speak with you. Uh, luckily, I didn't go to, to Vietnam. God only knows what would happen at that time. Getting out of the Army, I got offers to go to quite uh, an elaborate, I mean, quite uh, uh, offers from colleges for my soccer ability. Mm -hmm. And also, I had a great average in high school. So getting out of high school, and I made All-American in soccer, I was offered a Wharton School of Business, which is a very, as, as you know, very extinguished uh, a business uh, college, I mean, PA. And I couldn't go because I, I was alone, I didn't have any money, but I was offered a scholarship, but again, room and board yeah. and all of that, I just could not afford it. So what I've done, uh, what I've done, uh, I went to a two-year school, State University, graduated with a business administration degree, and uh, then at that time I was looking to transfer, and uh, IBM Endicott offered me a part-time job. Mm. That's how I came to Binghamton and oh. finished my four-year degree at State University of Binghamton and came to this area. As I, as I worked in this area, I met people uh, from Owego. And to uh, make a long story short, I came to Owego uh, in 1975. And uh, in 1978, I met my most wonderful wife, Ter Terry. And she was born in Troy, PA, and uh, came, she uh, went to uh, school and was raised in Horsets. Mm. So being 
being, uh, I met Terry, and that was the beginning of basically my, my life, if, you, if I may say. Mm -hmm. Brian? Hi. <laughs> That's Brian right there. <laughs> um, as my wife and I got to know each other, I, um, uh, we uh, basically uh, lived in Oviedo and uh, got married later on uh, in 1984 and had two daughters. Prior to that, me uh, uh, be, being married to Terry, I started, work, I started <clears throat> to look for a job. I was working at that time for Grossman's in Vestal, uh -huh. uh, just uh, on a management uh, type of, if you remember Grossman's yeah. in Vestal. <laughs> and uh, I joined the uh, Wego Fire Department. Uh, Mr. Franz, uh, late Mr. Franz, uh, was the, uh, was the uh, fire chief, and he said, well, don't you stop by the fire station and come and visit us and mm -hmm. look around. But that's all it took, <laughs> you know. I looked yeah. around, and right. 15 years later, with your Wego Fire Department, hey. I uh, donated uh, that many years of free, free uh, <coughs> volunteer yeah. to the Wego Fire Department, and 10 years of that was with the uh, Oviedo Emergency Squad. Mm. So... Doing that, I met a gentleman, uh, and I will get to my police work and how I got into the police and the sheriff's department, but then I will tell you about my achievements in business, because the two actually went side by side all these years, and a lot of you probably don't know my business side of it, because you only see me in uniform. And I do have a business side uh, of, of my life that I'm very, very proud of. <clears throat> uh, at that time, as my wife and I were planning our life and lived in Oviedo uh, and being at the Oviedo Fire Department, and I've been a line officer and I've been Ivy uh, and I've been uh, on the squad uh, and uh, I've been an Ivy Tech, the whole thing I, I've done for ten years there. I met a gentleman called Steve Yuta, and he was the general manager of the Oviedo Penny Saver Press. Huh. And he approached me uh, one night at uh, the fire meeting after the fire meeting and said. Uh, so what are you doing with your life? I go, trying to work, I'm working at Grossman's, and you know, he says, uh, would you consider of applying for another job? And I said, it depends. I didn't know what he, what he meant. He said, why don't you come and see me tomorrow at the Oviedo Penny Saver Press, and we'll talk about it. I said, okay, I'm not gonna miss an opportunity, you know. So I went, we had a nice talk, and I said, to uh, what are you offering? He says, well, I think you're going to do well in sales. And I want to offer you a sales job with your Wego Penny Saver Press. He says, you're going to be local, you're going to be home, you don't have to travel. I said, sounds good. Sounds good. I took it. And uh, I was there for 17 years at the Wego Penny Saver Press. And I became their sales manager after I took that job years yeah. to come. I loved that business part of it because what I've done is I traveled all through Tioga County mm. and I met people from Berkshire to New York Valley and so on and so forth that, and all the business people that I dealt with, which was great. And uh, you know they got to know me quite well and I got to know them and the mirror was almost a Tioga County household word, you know, which I, was, I wasn't running for office or anything. Wow. Right, no? <laughs> <laughs> and um, that gave me an opportunity not only to um, really enjoy something that I, I really like to do through the years, but it gave me an opportunity to meet tremendous, wonderful, beautiful people in Tioga County. And it made me feel more at home made me feel like I belong. Having said that, on the other, the other side, uh, that was at the Oviedo uh, Penny Saver Press and I was at the fire department, there was quite a few deputies that were at the Oviedo Fire Department. Mm. And one particular night, uh, a deputy said, uh, hey, the mayor, why don't you come and ride with me one night? And then, on those days, you have to just get a signature that you could ride and then you can ride. Oh. That's all it took. <laughs> <laughs> I went for a ride and lo and behold, that's what I wanted to do. And I met Sheriff Ray Ayers, as all of you probably remember him. 
He was a great, great sheriff and a great friend of mine through, throughout the years. Sheriff Ray Ayers took me under his wing. He liked me a lot. God only knows why, but he did. And he gave me an opportunity. I said, look, I like my business end of it. I'm never going to make the money working as a sheriff's deputy as I would do in business. But I don't mind working part time. I said, I always, I always look for you know, the plan behind the plan. If plan A doesn't work, then you move to plan B and I have backup, right? I said, I don't mind working part time. He says, well, he says, uh, we do want part timers. Why don't you consider uh, joining our team? So I did. I accepted that. But never, that never interfered with my Owego Penny Saver Press. It went hand in hand because why? Owego Penny Saver Press was during the day. Yeah. Sheriff's Department was from 4 to midnight, midnight to 7. And boy, did I work those hours sometimes. Yeah. Believe it. Yeah. So I joined the Tioga County Sheriff's Department in conjunction being a volunteer with the Weagle. And I went to a seven month school, uh, the academy, graduated that, and uh, did two years as a jailer at Tioga County Sheriff's oh, Department. I started right from the bottom, mm -hmm. I'm telling you. And uh, I learned from the bottom, and then uh, as, I, as I accomplished that, I started on road patrol and worked many, many hours, many Christmases, many New Year's, and still worked at the Oigo Fantasy. And my wife also worked here. She worked, uh, she, uh, worked at uh, Deepwell a few, few times there, and then she worked at uh, the Treadway, so we really, uh, you know, we were really working ourselves to, to uh, our marriage date, you might say. Ah. And <clears throat> as, as I joined both teams, uh, I really excelled also at the Sheriff's Department by becoming a part-time canine unit, which is very difficult at times to, if you're not a full-timer. And I had my canine, my first canine, which was a little Rottweiler. And then later on, when I joined the Kinder Police Department, I also had my canine here working for a few, few times. So in 1984, my wife and I, in 83, 84, my wife and I got married, and we lived on the south side in Owego. We had a house there. Meanwhile, with all this thing was going on, I had an opportunity through my business in Owego Penny Saver a gentleman that uh, uh, had had a uh, had uh, uh, the Elmira County Penny Saver in Elmira, oh. a good friend of mine, offered me a, an opportunity to invest and buy the Watkins Glen Penny Saver oh. or Schuyler County Penny Saver, yeah. which was about 20 years ago. I took him on, and we became partners, and uh, we bought the Schuyler County, which is the highlights. Penny Saver, still at the Sheriff's Department, right? And then the opportunity came, after we bought that, the opportunity came for me to come to Kander. Because Kander wanted to continue their police after so many years, and uh, we took it over, and uh, I started uh, 25 years ago here. So total, if you look at my, and then, and then I forgot almost. So many things happening in my life, as you can see. Between all that, Dale Weston, if you, I'm sure all of you know who Dale Weston is and Spencer, knocks on my door here in Candor on Main Street. Come here, can I talk to you? I have great respect for Dale. He's a great businessman, great, great man. I have great respect for him. And we're, we're extremely good friends of all these years because of, of, of all this. He says, uh, I know you're working here in Candor. But would you mind, would you mind uh, uh, thinking we don't have a, a Spencer Police Department anymore? Mm. And they didn't have it like for two years yeah. in that. He says, we would like to bring it back. He says, would you mind extending your services from Candor and we'll hire you up there with the Spencer Police Department because two of them will make it full time. Mm -hmm. So of course. <laughs> That's all I needed. Yeah. And I worked at Spencer Police Department in this 25 years that I worked here, 12 years. 
I got all my credits for near state retirement, and I, I did well on that. But I worked, and because I wasn't afraid of working. But I enjoyed that work. I enjoyed working for the Sheriff's Department here in Kander for 25 years and Spencer for 12. Altogether, I have 35 years in service, in uniform, serving my Tioga County, and I'm very proud of that. I met, uh, again, so many people that are fantastic. And I love to work here. I loved it because, can you imagine, not only being a foreigner, I wasn't born in Canada, but I survived 25 years with you people. That is totally incredible. It, it is incredible, and I'm, I'm proud of that achievement. I really am. Some of my achievements and my uh, things in a, in a, in a police and <clears throat> fire, I, uh, as I said, I received uh, a uh, uh, diploma from the uh, police academy. Uh, the Oviedo Fire Department, I already told you about that. I also received some awards being a police officer. Mm. And on December 98, received an award from New York State Police along with Sergeant Capcho, which you already know who Sergeant Capcho is. He lives right next door here. Responded to, a, we responded to the village bar in 98, where a 29-year-old male was known to be a convicted felon with a handgun. Sergeant Capcho and I re recovered the Smith & Wesson 38 caliber, fully loaded, at the bar, without incident. And that was an accomplishment. Let me tell you, it was a scary, scary moment. But yeah, nothing happens in Canada, right? <laughs> That's what happens, right? I also received an award uh, responding to a wooded area uh, uh, here in Canada by the state lands. And uh, New York State Police, Sergeant Capcho, and Tioga County Sheriff's Department also, and Kander Squad, responded to a wooded area with uh, young, uh, young people having a party. And we thank God we did respond because one young man was in an alcoholic coma. And we saved his life. And we got commendation for that, responding, and make sure that he got proper, you know, uh, proper uh, uh, medical help. On March of 87, Acting Sheriff Lieutenant Paul Rhodes of Tioga County Sheriff's Department gave an award for meritorious work in a hostage crisis situation, and that was in Waverly, New York. 24-7, we were with a hostage in a barricaded in a, in a, in a home, oh. and that, uh, that took quite a lot of... Yeah. Uh, you know, courage, and uh, because we didn't know if he had a rifle, we didn't know anything, and mm -hmm. we were there for a long, long time. But everything went well, and I received an award for that for mm -hmm. handling the crisis the way we should have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In '89 and 1980, from investigator Gary Gould, if you remember him, he's he's long retired from the criminal division, Tioga County Sheriff's Department, for excellent job in tracking with my canine on two separate cases a residential burglary and an armed robbery of a store. Oh. And we found the individual oh. with my canine, oh, track right. uh, And I received a, 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 an award for that. Yeah. After I'm done, I'll, I'll have questions and answers if you like. I'll be very happy to answer any questions you might have. People ask me, what is your memorable moments, you know, like dangerous moments in candor working this stretch? As you well know, you see us stopping vehicles because they, they're coming from Ithaca and they're going like in a 30, they don't even think yeah. it's a yeah. 30. Right. So you see us stopping. <clears throat> I'm, telling, I'm telling you now, I wouldn't tell you when I was working, but my criteria, if I stopped everybody doing 40s, I would have carpal tunnel. <laughs> so I didn't do it. <clears throat> I didn't do it. When I was stopping, and I, you see my lights quite a lot, I was stopping people going over 50. My highest was 87 oh, here oh, in my yeah. career, 87. <laughs> Young man going home to New Jersey from college. Oh, okay. wow. He didn't get there. <laughs> the other, uh, so, you know, uh, what can happen in Candor? Well, it's fairly busy because we're in the middle, yeah. you know, mid middle of three big cities, so everything is passing us by. And we, all, we always have to be vigilant. 
There's another moment where I, I, <clears throat> I was stopping a vehicle, and uh, the driver did not respond to me at all. Uh, lights on and everything siren, and I couldn't figure it out, so I pulled like this next to him, and I'm motioning him, and yeah. he finally pulled over. I pulled back, and as soon as I pulled back, and I got out of the car, his whole seat and him disappeared backwards. Oh. Oh. Nothing in front of me. Oh. A little <clears throat> unnervy. Yeah. I'm yelling, show me your hands, get up, do nothing. Uh -huh. Nothing happens. The window's down. His window's down. Oh, boy. I uh, didn't like the situation. Tioga County Sheriff's Department was responding to back me up. Uh -huh. And um, we finally got on a, on a, on a speakerphone. Nothing. I mean, loud nothing. I op we finally got to the car, and I opened the back door, kneeling down the deputies behind me. Uh, backing me up. I just opened slightly the door, mm -hmm. slammed the door. I said, he has something in his hands. Oh, boy. I didn't know what. Yeah. Okay, it was that fast. People don't realize the situation when you're in, mm -hmm. how you have to react. And it's really, really hard to explain to just how we feel in situations like that. Well, anyway, we, uh, to not prolong it, we got him out of the car. We cuffed him and everything, and all of a sudden we realized he couldn't speak or he couldn't hear. And what he had in his hand was a Bible. Oh. So when I brought him here, I wrote, why didn't you do something or give us some kind of a uh, signal yeah. that you're okay and hands up or so that we know that you're not hiding something? He writes back, he says, I was scared. I wrote him then. You have no idea how scared I was. <laughs> but in those type of situations, it could have been worse. He could have been killed. We could have done, uh, you know, uh, an unjustly, uh, you know. But we have to protect ourselves. We are, we, are, we are taught that we have family and time is on our side. And we have to come home at night. And we have to make those critical decisions in seconds. You know, we can't do it on Monday night quarterback. The other, the other, this is a little bit funny, uh, but um, I, I was working with my canine, and um, I, it was 11.30, I uh, put my canine away here on Main Street, fed him, mm -hmm. and Sheriff's Department's calling me, says, there is 1192, which is a DWI coming from Ithaca, can you respond? Oh boy. I said, yeah, I put my canine away, and uh, once you feed your canine, you can't put him back in the car and work it. So I left the canine home. Sure enough, I find the car right here by Dandy. I stopped the car, young man, about 24, 26 years of age. <clears throat> Shirt, tie, well dressed, huh. surely drunk, definitely. Wow. I start interviewing him and uh, went through the paces of me doing my sobriety tests mm -hmm. and the whole bit. And uh, proceeded to tell him that he was going to be under arrest for DWI. While he made an aggressive move, he grabs me, I grab him, clipped him, we start rolling, and I'm calling for help. <laughs> now imagine, this was shift change, 11.30, midnight. Sheriff's Department 15 minutes away, if they're going full blast, so 15 minutes, it's an eternity yeah, when you're yeah. fighting with somebody. Yeah, all right. Somebody heard me. And somebody, I see the hand come over yep. and grab the guy, and I look up, I said, thank you, Gary. He says, no problem. We, we cuffed him, put him in. I had to go to the hospital because my, my hand was all uh, uh, bent and my, my fingers were all, you know. So I went, I went to process him down to the sheriff's department, did all the paperwork. And this was like, uh, by the time I got done with the emergency room and they put my hand in a cast, it was like 3 or 4 o'clock, 7 o'clock, I was back doing paperwork, mm -hmm. and uh, I put my canine in my car, and I drive up here, and the sheriff's department brought the gentleman here. Of course, in the morning, he's sober and everything is fine. Mm -hmm. and he's apologizing left and right. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I said, no problem. I said, uh, uh, I go, uh, you had more of a problem, I said if I had my dog with me last night. Oh, yeah. right. I, went, I just went 
the Rottweiler stands up, yep. he looks, and this guy should see his face. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I said, but that's not your only problem. You have a worse problem. I said, coming up. He said, I'm sorry, I really am. I said, you know, I know two types of drunks. You're happy drunk, and then the combative drunk. Yeah. I said, you and alcohol don't mix, young man. I said, but you're gonna have a big problem. So he walks through that door. We're here. I've been in this room many times. <laughs> yeah. okay. mm -hmm. And I go, I know you don't remember this. I said, I have, you know, I put him down, he's sitting down. Mm -hmm. I said, I know you don't remember this, but I want you to meet Gary Dents. Remember Gary? Remember what you said to him last night? Because Gary heard me on his scanner, Judge Dents, drove down and helped me with this individual because my backup was so far away. Yeah. And you should see the guy going, oh no. <laughs> anyway, he was a Cornell student going to Florida to be a lawyer. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so I said, this is a good lesson to you. And, uh, luckily, he didn't have any priors, so they, you know, they plea bargained, and you know, and obviously he got charged because I was hurt and the whole bit. But those are some of those uh, moments that uh, I yeah. wanted to tell you because people, you know, always ask me, what is your most favorite moment? You know, mm -hmm. I should have kept a book of all the things people yeah, right. told me. You right. know, when I when I used to stop. Mm -hmm. So anyway. Uh, Working here has been a great pleasure because it made me feel really close to the people that I wanted to serve. And uh, especially the elderly people that called the house for, not only for police work, but mm -hmm. for, Tamir, can you help me with this? I have a problem with that. Just to ask me a few questions that I, I'm, I'm really, I was really, uh, you know, able to help in any way I can. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes our community, um, you know, the giving and the caring. And uh, Candor has been fantastic for that. And I, I, I really, truly enjoy, uh, uh, you know, living here. Now, my two daughters, one is Candor High School graduate. The other one was earlier part when I was in Oledo. Mm -hmm. Her name is Natasha. She's my youngest, my oldest is Jennifer, her husband, and her and three kids, three daughters, my granddaughters, live in Lake George area. Oh. He is also a police officer. <laughs> she kept it in the family. <laughs> <laughs> he's, uh, he's a Sheriff's Department uh, Sergeant, Warren County Sheriff's Department, Lake George area. Oh. Uh, and uh, they have a beautiful life, and, and it's been uh, great up there. My youngest one graduated from high school here in Candor, and got married to her high school sweetheart. Mm. And you'll probably all know the family, which is the Stapleton family, Jason Stapleton. And Don Stapleton, if you remember, the, the late Don Stapleton. And uh, that's Jason Stapleton that mm. she's married to. I'm very proud of my both son-in-laws. Jason, right now, uh, Jason, I, I respect it a lot, too. Mm. You know why? He had enough nerve to come and ask the chief of police, the only boy that had enough nerve to come on my back door and knock on the door and say, can I take your daughter out to a movie? Aww. And I respected that. You know how kids are. Who cares, you know? I, after a while, I go, Jason, sit down. Let me ask you a few questions. Yeah. All right. <laughs> what are your plans for the future? He says down, he says, sir, that's a good way to start, yeah. sir. He says, um, this is what I like to do, sir. I like to finish college. I like to go to Daytona, an aeronautical school. I'm going to join the Marine Corps, and I'm going to fly a helicopter because I want to be a pilot. Mm -hmm. right. That is unheard of, that somebody would know exactly yeah. what they want to do. Mm. Well, my daughter married him. Mm -hmm. I'm proud to say that they have the only grandson in the whole family, <laughs> which is, his name is Roman, he's three years old, oh. and now she's expecting her second child. Oh. And my wife is in uh, with her right now, just oh. to, uh, to give her some hand and help yeah. her. She's not doing until June. Anyway. Mm -hmm. But Jason did everything he said. 
he would do. He accomplished everything he said, and he's a proud captain in a Marine Corps, being, being a pilot of a helicopter. But not only that, this coming year he's going to be a major, promoted to major, and to a great honor to our family that he got selected to be the Marine One pilot for the next president of the United States of America. Wow. A candor boy, a candor raised boy, that he's going to be part of that group. And I'm very, very proud for our family, for him, and for my daughter. So I have two daughters married to two great guys and made my retirement beautiful because they only come home to visit, if you know what I mean. <laughs> So um, as I, as I, you know, went through my life, I wasn't afraid of work. I wasn't afraid mm -hmm. of achieving something for myself, and I always had plans for my retirement. Mm -hmm. I always had plans that I want to retire. We want to go down to Florida uh, in the winter time, uh, and then we we want to go to Europe, uh, you know, for uh, you know month or so, mm -hmm. uh, and visit our family yeah. in Europe, and we have. A, a, a beautiful, uh, you know, opportunity to do so. So those things, as my son-in-law planned his life, I planned my life throughout, and it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. Uh, again, you know, uh, uh, growing up, and uh, they gave me the, the, the opportunity. But I owe a lot to my wife too, because uh, as much as I worked, I have, you know, I have her right behind me. And uh, guided me, and you know, mm -hmm. and uh, took care of the uh, Watkins Glen business too, while I was doing the police business. And uh, this year we sold the business to our general manager, who was with us for 20 years, mm -hmm. and her and her husband. So wow. it worked out real well. Yeah. We sold our house in Candor. We moved to Watkins Glen above the business, and we remodeled a two-bedroom apartment, and we downsized oh. because we travel a lot. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, being there, uh, we like it, but I always return back to Candor. No matter what. <laughs> and, of course, Bryant knows that uh, when he needs me, I will, I'm still part of the police department here in Candor. And uh, when he needs me, when he's away, I can sub for him. So it still keeps me in the, you know, community and in the police department mm. and uh, being active. So with, with that in mind, I would like to, in closing... Let me first say that thank you for having me speak to you this evening. As we come to a close and after serving this wonderful community for 25 years, I feel that I have served you and the residents of Candor without, with utmost respect and professionalism, with an unblemished record, if I may say, in my police work. In closing, thank you for your support and caring and I will always call Candor my home. Thank you. To answer. I have a question, but I, I wanted to make a little, tell a little story about Mr. Demir here. He, he, uh, <laughs> Go ahead. I was, one time uh, he was talking about Jason and it made me think of the this, this story. Uh, I often run around, you know, go jogging around the town, and one day I was running by the cemetery here, and Roy Arrington was out mowing, and he uh, he hollered at me and says, says, you better slow down, there's a police up there. <laughs> <laughs> sure enough, Demir, at least the park over here, it wasn't, so I went over to him, because his daughter Natasha and my daughter Beth were really good friends from high school. And I started talking, asking him about Natasha. He said, oh, i got to show you a picture. i got to show you a picture. I thought it would be a picture of Natasha. Oh, no. It's a picture of Jason's helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Of course. <laughs> yes, I just wondered, Croatia, language, English, or? Uh, they speak, a, yeah, a lot of young people speak English. No, you. I mean, growing up, did you speak English? Not a word. So and you had to learn. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm uh, multilingual. I speak uh, fluent Croatian, I speak fluent Italian, a little bit of English, <laughs> <laughs> but then uh, I, I do understand quite well the dialects of uh, Bosnian, Serbian, Slovenian, and uh, there's a particular uh, uh, language in Istria. Uh, if you know Italian and you know Croatian, the, the, uh, uh, it's a beautiful language, but it's totally separate from 
Croatian and Italian. It's a mixture of two. Oh. And oh. If, it's a beautiful language, uh, and I'm fluent in that. So mm -hmm. I'm multilingual. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't just have a time to practice it. When I go back every year, then I practice. This is a weird question. No. <laughs> uh, do you think in English or Croatian? No, that's a good question. Uh, English. <laughs> I was going to say when the Uyghur churches brought in Bosnian refugees yes. way back in the, in the early 90s, the mayor was a big help. Yes. I yeah. mean, some of them spoke oh. English, but the mayor, you helped. Yeah, because you were there. Yeah, you were, you were brought involved. In a group and the family brought in what, three or four right. families. And, and uh, the family uh, still, still here uh, yeah, in Oregon, uh, but they're moving to Texas because the two sons uh, went, uh, went, went to Texas. And some so. moved to Groton, and they yeah. a great family. Yeah. yeah. You know, I'm proud of my he uh, heritage. I guess we all are because we're all from somewhere. <laughs> but uh, I'm proud, uh, you know, to be uh, an American citizen. I'm proud to be part of, you know, and I America is always going to be my America, my home. And I'm finding out, unfortunately, that tr uh, that uh, uh, nowadays the um, you know a, a lot of immigrants that come over, they don't come over with the same idea that I came over, yeah. you know, to become American. Unfortunately, uh, they they don't think of you know, integrating into the American society, which I, I feel very, very, very sad, very, very bad. Because I'm very proud to be an American. Mm -hmm. I'm very proud. Yeah. Um, you said you had two fathers, and your O'Brien has two daughters. Have you given them interview tips for the boyfriends that they <laughs> Maybe we can talk about that, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's what happens when you have daughters, Brian. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Anybody else? Any, any, any questions? Okay, well, I want to thank you for inviting me. And uh, uh, as I said, I'm, I'm always going to be, uh, you know, this is always going to be my home. And, you know, I'll, I'll visit, of course. And you'll see me sometimes probably in the patrol car, you know, helping him. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.